Today, I want to talk to you about this grassroots movement uh, for the credibility revolution, for trying to improve psychological science. Uh, the first few sessions in this course uh, were more about the uh, science crisis, the replication reproducibility crisis, the different attempts by different people and groups to try and assess what's going on with our science and to try and uh, push things forward, to fix things that are broken, to build tools, infrastructure, to help others do better. And we try best we can in whatever we do in this course, you know, both the replications and the RR assessment and the guides and the opinions that you share. Uh, we open this up for the community, for everybody to be able to take what we do, take all the guides, take all the replications, take all the, the data, the code, uh, manuscripts, whatever we have, and, and, and do similar things in their own labs, in their own universities, so that we can all we can all benefit from this. I, I was not always like that. I grew up in an environment where this was not the default. And actually, many times when I tried to do this on my own, uh, I got some pushback. I was criticized for this. And I'm very happy to see that the last five years, the last decade, things are changing uh, very fast. Here at HKU, I'm trying to promote some of these things, although it's it's going it's going slowly. Uh, it's happening fast, you know, with the students that I'm working with. So, with Chinyu and with Kit, I think they're very uh, supportive of this and they're trying new things with me. But generally, I'm hoping that we'll be more of a community here at HKU, more of a community here in Hong Kong, more of a community here in Asia, and generally uh, in in many collaborators that we have around the world we can build something that would help uh, all scientists, all students, all people um, assess science better, uh, do better science, understand, understand science. So I want to share with you some of the people and the projects that I've learned from. I've learned um, you know, by uh, working with them, by attending their workshops, visiting them, following them on Twitter. And I want to kind of inspire you to find uh, your own group of people that you think uh, might help you in your own journey when you're doing your uh, internships, when you're doing your thesis, uh, when you're going in the industry or in academia or whatever it is that you're doing your next step. There's so many inspiring people out there that you can, that you can learn from. And I also want to give you the message that many of them are uh, what we perceive to be people with uh, no power, uh, students, early career researchers that have just decided on their own to try and do something. And by the power of community, by the power of openness, they're able to accomplish uh, amazing things. So uh, hopefully this will give you some inspiration in your own, in your own journey. I'm going to start from these mass collaboration projects uh, because I think this is one of the biggest changes that has happened following the replication crisis. So we, we learned that we need to start working together. Uh, if I work on my own, you work in your own lab, you know, each, each to his own, uh, we're going to make much slower progress. If we work together, we can achieve a much, much greater impact. So starting from things like how to do replications. So let's say that we realize we haven't been doing replications and we need to do replications. How do we do this? How do we execute this together as a community? I wanna start uh, from the slide that I showed you in the first session about uh, why am I doing this course the way that, that I am? Why, why are we doing replications and extensions? Why is this so important for us to understand? Replications and open science, uh, we, we came here for advanced social psychology. So why are you bothering us with all these things? So it started for me from these two uh, articles. I really believe that students, you, are the answer to psychology's replication crisis, not just psychology, but science in general. Uh, but this one dating back to 2012 about the need to teach replications. In your syllabus, you have a few citations about why I decided that this is the best tool for you to understand science. This is the best tool for you to understand how to assess the things that you read in the book, how to assess the things that you get in your courses, how to assess the things 
that your PI, that your lab manager, that people uh, in your lab tell you about the, the status of the field. Doesn't have to be social psychology, could be anything else, but it's really important for you to engage and do things uh, hands-on. Uh, the two very inspiring projects that I want to uh, introduce to you are the Psychological Science Accelerator. And this started by early career researchers. So um, some of them are now assistant professors, but uh, many postdocs, PhD students that came together in order to uh, start, start running these mass, mass replication uh, projects. But uh, the Psychological Science Accelerator goes far beyond replications. Right now, let's say that you have a really interesting idea and you want uh, to run this, but you don't have resources. You don't have money to uh, you know, conduct the, the data collection. Uh, you want to run things in different cultures. Let's say you're a cross-cultural psychologist. You want to see differences between different parts of the world, uh, but you don't have the means or, or the, the budget or the access. You can come up with a proposal, submit this to Psychological Science Accelerator, and if it's a good proposal, going, you know, to have a, a sort of a democratic uh, process over there, if it's chosen, they will, they will do everything in order to run things in many labs across uh, many uh, countries around the world. Uh, so that, that's really inspiring. I'm going to start with Michelle over here, uh, who uh, did a remarkable thing. We'll come back to this later. Uh, during her PhD, she did her PhD about spotting errors in, in, in articles. So she wrote StatCheck, uh, which uh, checks your statistics in, in, your, in your manuscript, uh, which inspired a whole, a whole new area of uh, automatic tools to help us understand, understand how we do in science. So let, let's hear a little bit from Michelle about these mass collaborations. Um, so these multi-lab collaborations, um, I think in um, uh, genetic studies, they, they um, arose to make sure that the results were robust. In psychology, this was a pretty new concept. Um, until a couple of large projects were arising. So we have, for instance, a series of many lab projects. We have many labs, one, two, three, up until four or five right now, I think, where several labs worldwide are looking at the same or set of questions to to say something about replicability of findings and heterogeneity in these findings, etc. Um, we now have the psychological science accelerator, where you can, where democratically a research question is chosen in order to set up a multi-lab collaboration with countries all over the world. Um, we have something called study swap, and I think the, the inventor of this, Chris Chartier, once called it Tinder for scientists. Um, where you can, um, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure if he's happy that I'm saying that right now, um, but the idea is that if you run a study in psychology in a lab, then often participants can uh, get credit for an hour per participant, and they're in a lab and they're doing some computer tasks, and it's highly likely that your task only lasts for 20 minutes, which means that you have 40 minutes of time left where your participants can yes, still do something. Well, maybe someone else on the other side of the world uh, has the same situation, but doesn't get enough participants. Well, then maybe you can help each other and run each other's experiment in that time slot that you have left. That's the basic idea of study swap. Um, and these registered replication reports, again, also multi-lab collaborations that are happening in psychology right now. Yeah, so there's also study swap. It's not uh, as active as I would like it to be. But it's a really interesting uh, project where uh, you can, let's say you have an idea, you uh, set up the idea, maybe you submitted this as a register report, you got in principle acceptance, but you don't have anybody else, uh, you know, you don't have a way to run this. You just post it over there asking who wants to join me, uh, who wants to collaborate. And then some people will say, hey, I have a participant pool. How about I run this for you? And vice versa, let's say that you have participant pool or you have uh, ways, you know, you have a lab, but you don't have uh, a, a new idea, you don't want to take all the risk, you can join somebody else who also already has in principle acceptance from the register report. So this allows different people from around the world to find each other and start start collaborating, which is wonderful. I uh, It's a new, a new era, if only this would kind of uh, keep going and, and find more, more people. When it comes to this uh, psychological science accelerator, it's really based on this idea from CERN. If you're uh, familiar with what's happening in Europe, you know, the, the 
building this remarkable project to get physicists to uh, collaborate because you understand that if you want to run expensive experiments if each country would do this on their own uh, it would be impossible to pull this off but if you set up a collaboration between different countries then you can achieve wonderful things so why only for physicists we can also do this with psychological science so chris over here uh, really uh, it's, it's amazing uh, how fast he did this so this idea started like 2017 kind of like as an idea um, and then following uh, different conferences that, that we had, like the Society for Improvement of Psychological Science and the Twitter sphere announcing that we, uh, that we want to build this sort of thing, it started as, as a one man's idea push uh, in this kind of blog post. And then a lot of people uh, came in and joined this to create the most remarkable thing. I just, I was looking at this today and I was thinking, oh my God, so it's already 73 countries over a thousand researchers from around the world. You can see some countries uh, or areas in the world are more represented than others. So uh, big, big stuff going on in the US, in the UK, in the Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands, uh, with some, some presence in different parts of Asia. So there's, uh, uh, we, we used to have one in Hong Kong. Uh, there's uh, one that's very active that I visited not too, far, not too long ago. Uh, in Taiwan, they have a few in Japan, as you can see. Uh, the Australians are very active. Recently, I also visited in Brazil and saw that they're 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 into it. So it seems like it's growing. But the the magnitude of this, I did not expect it. And within two years, to get this kind of this kind of scale and the stuff that they're doing, is incredible. Uh, both Chinyu and Kit uh, joined me to do uh, stuff in the psychological science accelerator about COVID. So they try to address issues that have to do with COVID. So we ran this data collection over here using our participant pool with uh, Hong Kong undergraduates. Uh, we also did another one that has to do with morality. So we looked at the ones that we can contribute to uh, and we, we uh, you know, did data collection, uh, did data analysis. And finally, together with many other scholars in a, a collaborators list, authorship, of, of hundreds of people, uh, we will be there, uh, very proud to take uh, part in the, these kinds of initiatives. So really a revolution in psychological science. And I really like their, their principles because they, they stand for a lot of things that we believe in, in, in the open science community. So it has a lot about diversity and inclusion. So really it doesn't really, it doesn't matter what level you are, is it if you're a full professor or you're undergraduate student, everybody has something to contribute. Uh, it, it doesn't need to be led by, you know, what's perceived by some to be the center of academia. It definitely doesn't need to be UK, US. It doesn't need to be Ivy League. It can come from, from all sorts and everybody pulls in uh, resources uh, together. All the things that we talked about regarding rigor and transparency, openness about everything, and also um, being uh, willing to learn and improve. Openness to criticism is very, very important. So also transparency helps address all of that. Uh, learn step by step. At the beginning, there were some you know, challenges, but I can see they're getting, they're getting better every time. And they're also dealing with much uh, larger uh, scope. So you can see it's the first blog post is 2017. And now where we are, it's only three years and they go to 400 labs. And I think this is not even that updated. A lot of projects already accepted in, in the best of journals uh, that we have uh, really terrific, terrific stuff. It's, it's a remarkable thing. So Michelle, uh, uh, she, she mentioned the many labs, many labs one to five. I covered some of their findings in the first week. So uh, you, you already know a little bit about the replication findings. Uh, just, just now the many labs five came out, uh, really outstanding stuff to investigate whether, um, whether collaborating with original authors really helps um, achieve higher replication outcomes. And the, the bottom line is that probably not. It doesn't seem to, to help much. But before that, we got a lot of pushback by people saying, oh, of course you didn't replicate this well because you didn't have the original authors. But now because we have a lot of these, 
published in AMPPS. Um, we now know we have we have an answer uh, that, that can address some of that criticism. Uh, I took many, I didn't even realize that there's so many, many labs. <laughs> so I went, uh, I found this uh, article, Replication on the Rise, and it's not just replications, they, they do all sorts of things, but it doesn't matter what you, what you like to do. Let's say that you work in a lab that does developmental stuff with kids. Uh, there's many babies, so a lot of studies about babies uh, that are being replicated by many labs around the world. And the main one I think is in Stanford, but you can like go on the website and have a look at what, what they're doing in uh, developmental psychology. Uh, so cute stuff going on over there. Many primates, let's say that you're working with, uh, uh, I don't know, monkeys or gorillas and you wanna replicate uh, stuff. So this is inspired by, by the many labs. So a lot of collaborations over there. Let's say that you're more of a neuroscientist and you belong to a lab that does uh, neuro EEGs and, and, and such. Don't know much about it, but you can go and check out uh, their status. They're, they have a Twitter, uh, Twitter hashtag. You can follow what it is that they do. Uh, let's say that you're an educational psychologist and you want to collaborate with others. You've got now uh, uh, many classes, which is, which is a really interesting uh, initiative. Uh, about all sorts of interventions in real classrooms. I was I was contemplating joining them in, in running some stuff perhaps with you, but my classes are not big enough. So I and they need they need some large classes to investigate all sorts of things. So maybe next time I run fundamentals of social psychology, I'll I'll, I'll join in in some of the stuff that they do. We already uh, talked a little bit about the ones that are in economics and the ones that are in social sciences. So even if you're in the business school, or you belong to uh, some other department that's not exactly social sciences. There's so many different uh, many <laughs> that you can you can really uh, find find what's what's uh, a good fit for you. And if not, there's an opportunity because by now they have so many resources. If you want to start your own many, uh, then then you can do that. Uh, we did our like. You know, the small scope of the my, my little lab. We did the many JDM, I guess we can call this, <laughs> in many students working on different JDM classes. But it's I I found I found a lot of inspiration in in all these projects. I love keeping track of them. I really enjoy seeing the outputs, um, uh, keeping track on Twitter to see how well they do. Some some terrific stuff. Uh, other projects that are uh, changing science. So we asked you in this uh, course to use uh, our studio or Jamovi. There's also JASP. So if you uh, attended my workshop or watched it afterwards, I show how far our studio um, has come and how convenient Jamovi is if you're addicted to SPSS and need to move on. I also demonstrated some of the amazing uh, packages that came from those. And these are all people who are, you know, our studio is kind of uh, backed up by, by a, non, a non-profit, but um, all of these, especially Jamovi, JASP, are by researchers, by students who uh, from their own time uh, are dedicated to this. So GZ Stats was started by, um, I think he was a postdoc at the time, maybe even a PhD student. Uh, one of the, the packages that I use a lot uh, in Mavis, in Jamovi, it's called Major, that does a meta-analysis by Kyle. Kyle was a PhD student when he started this. So students that decided that they want to contribute to science and, and change things. And it turns out that you don't need to pay you know, a lot of money to IBM and SPSS in order to buy expensive software that doesn't make sense and is stuck somewhere in the 80, not supporting open science. You can build your own open science tools. If you want to know more about this, if you're planning to do anything that has data analytics, not even in academia, let's say that you're going to be a, a do any data analysis of any sort in the future, you, you'd want to use some of these tools, maybe even contribute uh, to it. You can contribute in many different ways. Some people contribute by coding, some people contribute by doing guides um like us um maybe videos workshops like us uh, some people just you know give some feedback so reporting issues um just helping the community in any way that you can because whatever it is that you give is something that you're gonna get back many times 
we we reported the issues and i think uh um you know our, our tutors were were amazed with you know you report an issue to jamovi and the next day you have you have a fix it's it's outstanding the kind of the kind of sharing that happens in this community and hopefully uh, we can uh, lead to open transparent uh, science that really uh, you know doesn't have corporations involved in it that kind of you know prevent people from access to that to that knowledge a very inspiring I don't even know how to call this. Started as an organization, then it has a few things like it. It now now this open science uh, framework, the center of open science. It's kind of like it became sort of like it has everything that that incorporates open science in it. So the center of open science. Later we're gonna discuss uh, Brian Nosek uh, is is amazing because five years ago, you know, when I finished my PhD, two thousand and fourteen. We had none of this and the center of open science with the open science framework is nothing short of, of a revolution in both allowing you to share your data, allowing you to do pre-registrations, allowing you to really coordinate um, with, with other people around the world, do wikis, share things. Um, it, it's quite remarkable. So I'm going to play a video to you. It's about five minutes that just shows you the scale of what the Center of Open Science is doing. And if you're not familiar with some of that, I really strongly encourage you, I strongly encourage you uh, uh, to talk to your labs, um, to check out the capabilities of what they're doing. And there are lots of ways for you to, uh, to help. Uh, you can, you know, the basic thing is like, you can donate a few bucks here and there if, if you feel like it. But other thing is, it's like uh, you're just communicating with them and, and you know sharing, spreading the word, uh, using the platforms, uh, helping others use, use the platforms. So let's see just how far the center of open science has come in helping us do better, uh, more open science. Society invests billions of dollars in research each year and too much of that investment goes to waste. Researchers are rewarded for sensational findings rather than rigorous methods, transparent reporting, and unbiased results. This undermines the credibility of published findings. When others try to replicate the findings, they often fail, and when trying to translate the findings into solutions or cures, they don't work, wasting money, time, and giving false hope. The research culture's dysfunctional reward system and lack of transparency slows the pace of discovery. The open science movement is addressing these problems head on. Leading funders, publishers, and institutions are developing new initiatives and technologies to help researchers conduct more rigorous and transparent work and improve the availability of research data, materials, and outcomes. Open science reduces waste and accelerates the discovery of knowledge, solutions, and cures for the world's most pressing needs. Changing the research culture is daunting, but there are incremental steps at every stage of the research life cycle that can improve rigor and reduce waste. The Center for Open Science maintains the Open Source Open Science Framework, or OSF, an infrastructure that supports culture change by enabling rigor and transparency across the research life cycle. Some of the most critical issues that reduce scientific rigor can be addressed through an act called pre-registration. Pre-registering an analysis plan allows researchers to shine a light on what was planned beforehand versus what was discovered after the fact. This reduces hindsight bias and overconfidence that an uncertain discovery was predicted beforehand. Failure to pre-register is like releasing an arrow and then drawing the target afterward, making every shot a bullseye. But pre-registration records predictions in advance, making it meaningful when the target is hit and highlighting the uncertainty associated with serendipitous observations when the arrow is off the mark. It illuminates new possibilities researchers hadn't considered. Pre-registration also eliminates publication bias by making all studies discoverable, even if they're never published. Sharing all outcomes, not just novel results, increases transparency and trust in science. OSF supports pre-registration for many research methodologies using customized registration formats. With the OSF Registries service, groups can launch their own registries to help enhance rigor in their communities. 
OSF Registries has features to help researchers, such as the option to embargo registrations so that ideas aren't discovered too soon. A challenging area for rigor and transparency is also the most mundane, keeping track of one's own research materials and data. It's too common for teams to lose their own materials and data because of ad hoc and unreliable archiving solutions. OSF is a cloud-based, collaborative management service that ensures researchers will never lose their own work. Researchers deposit data, material, and documentation into private project spaces for their teams. They control who has access to what and when, and can decide whether to make some or all of the content accessible publicly or by request. OSF Institutions makes it even easier for organizations and universities researchers to sign in and use OSF, manage collaborative data, and increase visibility of institution-affiliated research. Universities can even connect their local repositories to OSF to integrate with their researchers' workflows. Even better, OSF and the OSF Preprint service make it easy to make all findings openly available, including their data and supporting material, even if they're never included in a published paper. OSF Preprints gives researchers control to communicate their findings as openly and quickly as possible so that others can benefit from the research, whether it shows a promising new direction or a likely dead end. Making all of this research available is most useful if it's also discoverable. Researchers need tools for searching and filtering to help them discover the content that's most relevant to them while accelerating their ability to build on the work of others. Groups can launch OSF collections to improve the discoverability of projects within their area of interest. With customizable filtering and taxonomies, OSF collections help foster communities of practice, giving researchers a place to discover work and share their own. By increasing rigor and transparency in planning, conducting, reporting, and discovery, the Center for Open Science is working to open up the whole research life cycle. An open life cycle accelerates the communication of findings within communities, even if they are never published, makes it easier to discover biases, errors, and false leads, expands the reuse of openly available materials, increases the reproducibility of findings, and maximizes return on research investments. Visit cos.io to learn more about accelerating discovery of knowledge, solutions, and cures. Very dramatic music. Uh, nice, nice to see the Center of Open Science like putting this together. Um, what I want to show you a little bit, if you've attended my workshop, then you know how much I use Open Science Framework, but Open Science Framework is like everything that we do. So you can see the number of projects that I have, like almost everything that I do in terms of research uh, is over there. You can see, for example, with uh, 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 Chinyu and Kit and, and other collaborators, like we do a bunch of stuff together, all our applications and extensions uh, with the students from previous years. I think you've seen that all my course materials I share with you on the Open Science Framework, all my registrations, uh, my pre-registration register reports, everything, everything that I do uh, is up here. So if you're not familiar with this, uh, you, you should really, um, I think by now you have, you have a, a login, uh, just use it as much as possible. It also allows, uh, you know, preprints, so all, almost all of the, all the preprints so we have all sorts of servers like, um, um, what's it called this? Sci archives. Uh, so you can see a lot of, and now it's tied. So if you upload a preprint over here, so all of this is tied back to uh, the Open Science Framework and some of our preprints. Uh, I can't remember exactly which ones I submitted to that specific one, but you can see quite a few of our preprints are up there. Uh, the most recent one, I guess, is the status quo bias with uh, Chinyu over here. So it's uh, uh, we, we use this on a regular basis. Almost almost uh, every day I have some interaction with the stuff that comes from the Center of Open Science. And just to think that, you know, five years ago, we, we didn't have anything. The, the, the scale, the scope, you know, they have funding to keep this stuff available, I think for 30 years into the future so that you don't have to worry that maybe at some point they won't have funding. It's 
really uh, uh, outstanding. I have, I've, I've uploaded already like gigabytes of, of stuff and, and there's never any problem. Nobody ever charged me any money. Nobody asked me to you know, re rethink, rearrange anything. It's just like uh, open for everybody to use as much as possible to promote, to promote science. It's, it's extraordinary. I really try and support them in any way that I can. Uh, some people around the world you know, have some concerns in all sorts of things. Like, for example, the Europeans said, we don't want to store everything in the US. So the Open Science Forum said, no problem. Now you can choose where you want to store this. So they have cloud uh, you know, options that you can do in Europe, in Australia, in other places around the world. So almost every concern that came up, they were able to address this. Uh, and just looking at their, their impact just this week, they were able to convince all the APA journals to adhere to the uh, top, uh, the TOP, uh, it's kind of uh, procedures to allow for higher transparency in all the APA journals, the um, association the, in, in the US for psychology, uh, which we all use, we all use the APA style. So having all the APA journals sign this kind of thing and, and adhere to the top guidelines is, is really extraordinary. And, and a lot of it has to do with the center of open science. Uh, so if you ever consider, you know, they have some jobs availability, let's say you don't want to be an academic, but you want to contribute to open science, you can check them up. Um, and then if you want to learn more about what it means to do better science, they have a lot of, uh, you know, things, initiatives that you can learn, learn from about how to promote all sorts of things, all their so-called products and the things that they, uh, the services that they provide in terms of training the communities that they have. So uh, many of us in the open science uh, community are what they call center of open science ambassadors. So going around the world and uh, connecting to people, talking to people, training them. So many of the people that I know that I follow on Twitter are, are here making a real, a real impact in their own in their own environment we had until not too long ago we had one at hku in the medical sciences but he recently moved to university of toronto so if you if you're doing your graduate school in hong kong or at hku and you feel like you want to pick this up we we have some availabilities uh, it would be amazing if you if you want to join this this kind of thing another thing that has happened is i i always thought about conferences is something that's very unuseful uh, and, and boring, honestly. So as a graduate student, I always had a lot of mixed feelings because it involves so much effort and costs so much money for you to fly halfway around the world in order to attend a conference where you feel very small and insignificant as a PhD student, especially if you're an undergraduate and you sit there in the back and you see the big shots from the Ivy League, you know, presenting um stroking their egos and saying look at how wonderful my research is uh you know th this this is kind of how i always thought about conferences where i felt like i don't have any contribution if i'm learning something is is you know it's um, kind of like a side effect to what i can learn by just you know staying staying at home and reading um articles and i don't get the benefits of let's say the mingling or the, the the interaction with the others which is very limited and somewhat biased in uh it's you know how welcoming they are to to outsiders so always very limited benefit but in recent years conferences in psychology have changed a lot because of the open science movement so i think the biggest revolution for me came from the society of improvement of psychological science i love this conference it's really made me so much more hopeful about things. All of the uh, amazing, um, not all, but ma many of the amazing initiatives that I shared with you uh, came from the Society uh, of Improvement of Psychological Science. So I met a lot of people. Many of our collaborators uh, started for me um, meeting them. But the thing about the, this conference, what makes this difference is that you don't have this thing about, you know, somebody coming up and presenting you know, this is what I did, um, you know, admire me, but rather the, the main point is having hackathons where you all sit together around table. It doesn't matter what your status is. You can be an undergraduate student. You can not even, you do not have to be a student. So 
starting from very young age, very early career, up to full professors and journal editors sitting together on one table with no hierarchy, working on a real problem together. So somebody raises an idea and says, maybe we need to do that. And somebody says, yes, we don't have a good tool. I'm also interested in this. So you come together and instead of using the conferences to kind of like show what it is that you've, you know, that you've personally done, it's to solve issues. So by the end of the three days of conference, you have a lot of new initiatives and exciting things that really help to improve uh, science, real solutions. So many of the great ideas that I'm familiar with in the last few years started in conferences like SIPS. Um, one that's coming up, if you want to attend, I, I think it's, uh, it's free for, for students, um, unless you want to donate, especially now everything is online. So uh, you, can, you can go ahead and register. This is coming up in, in December. They had a really amazing one. You can go and check out the lectures. Everything is online from last year. Uh, terrific stuff about meta research, open science. Uh, if you want to learn more about what's happening in the field, th this is a really good one. It's based in Australia, but now you know all of this became international. So a lot of the people who are attending are not from uh, from Australia, from all around the world. Uh, similar things, you know, more of the British context. But then, you know, now everything is online. Everything is vir virtual. You can uh, submit uh, even as an undergraduate. You can present. You can just attend. You can decide how involved you want to be. If there's some uh, hackathons that you want to uh, initiate, you could. Uh, there's all these things like uh, this one here uh, that allows you to build your own uh, hackathon. So if there's something that you're interested in, something that's not clear to you, something that you want to build, you'll find other people who are willing to do this with you. So conferences are changing. They're becoming more inclusive. They're more open. They're more accessible. And they're aimed towards real solutions to challenges that we have uh, in science. And they're a great power that promotes uh, you know, the advancement of the improvement of uh, science overall. So I'm very excited about these. I try and attend these as much as, much as I can. Um, with the corona, everything has moved online. So now you can here from here in Hong Kong, you can participate in many of those. And being an undergraduate is completely okay. You know, by now you have a lot of experience, replications and extensions and assessment. You might have more experience with open science than the average scholar. So uh, there's a lot that you can go in and contribute. I also want to briefly go over some changes in journals. So you're thinking, you know, we know journals. We we saw how how they work. Uh, you know, we do replications of journals like uh, journal personality and social psychology, um, you know, psychological science. I don't know what else you're reading in other courses, but these are sort of uh, old school journals and they're somewhat responsible for some of the problems that we have right now uh, in science. Um, so they're, they're slow to change, which just means that we need to come up with innovative solutions to try and change the way the journals function. So while these old style, old school journals take their time uh, to, to change, we come up with great, amazing new journals that really revolutionize uh, some, some of the things that are going on in science. There's all sorts of examples, for example, meta psychology, uh, completely free, open access, no processing fees, so it doesn't cost anybody anything to, uh, to submit, to, uh, to publish over there. It uses the open science framework in terms of the open, open peer review. So everything is done over there transparently. Everything that you submit, all the peer review, just like you're doing uh, with your uh, classmates, uh, the teammates, other other teams, everything is posted for everybody. There is no uh, anonymity. Uh, everybody contributes openly and is accountable to what it is uh, that they do. It's um, handled by the community, by editors from the open science community, who are doing this out of their own out of their own time and commitment. They're not getting paid for this in any way. And they, they've introduced all kinds of revolutionary things. For, so for example, journals typically don't really check the stats. They don't really check whether the code that you ran 
is uh, first of all open, then that it runs, uh, but they uh, make, you know, you need to make everything that you submit to this meta psychology uh, open, accessible, uh, both the data uh, and the code, the materials, and they check that it runs well and it meets uh, the, the stat in your, in your manuscript. So that's, that's remarkable. Um, they all, even with the code, you know, they insist on things like well-documented code. So you don't just do you know, what you feel like, you really need to make sure that everything is reproducible, that others, other people can, can verify what you've done. And it's remarkable that journals haven't done this so far. Like you really got to ask yourself, is, like, is what other journals doing, is that really science? If you're trusting people blindly without having any access to the data and the code, is that really science? Is that really reproducible? Uh, so meta psychology is trying to, to change, change the game uh, completely. Uh, we submitted uh, several registered reports and uh, replications to them. And so far, I have to say that the feedback that we got from the reviewers in that journal, from the editor, the kind of support, uh, extraordinary, really. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. And they will publish no findings. They will publish things from your file drawer. They, they are open to publishing everything that is you know, uh, relevant, uh, even if it's a uh, failed in the sense of failed application, no findings. Uh, even if things went wrong, as long as you're transparent about them, as long as you explain things clearly, you will find um, that meta psychology is, is happy to share this with, with the community. So if you're an early career researcher, if you want to try something revolutionary and different, I really encourage you to aim for meta psychology. Uh, Chinyu has a little bit of experience if you want to talk to him about this as an early career researcher. I, I talked a bit about register reports and what it's like for us to submit things. And meta psychology was one of the first uh, register reports that, that we did. So it's looking good. Uh, I think they're, they're starting to have a bit of a problem with scale, but um, maybe if more people will join, uh, more people willing to review, more people willing to support, then, then they'll do better. Recently, I think the editor went on Twitter and asked who is helping us review. You know, we have some problem during the pandemic to find reviewers who is willing to review. And then he, I think he was surprised to see just how many people reacted so positively and, and willing to help and contribute. So that's encouraging. Another one is, is Collabra. Um, it's also a kind of, it's, it's based, it's the journal of the Society of Improvement of Psychological Science. So it has, uh, once again, open peer review, it publishes replication, it uh, you know, focuses on transparency and openness policy. And in terms of fees, it's, all, it's, it's open access, but it costs some money unless you know, you, you're an er early career researcher and you can't afford this, or you come from a country where you can't uh, afford this sort of thing, or you can contribute by doing other things. So for example, in order to cover the fees, you can just review for them. So that makes things, uh, you, you have a bit, a bit more options to, to, uh, to, publish, to publish with them. And from what I've heard so far about their process, it's, it's, very, it's very supportive and very constructive. So I'm very hopeful uh, for this kind of uh, journal. I just want to show you, uh, this was posted recently. So Simin Vazir is the new editor of Collabra. She was there since the beginning, you know, one of the founders, but she was uh, because she was an editor of a different journal. So uh, she kind of uh, was more, more in the back, but now that she took over the ed editorial, she wrote a very interesting uh, article where she says what her policies are. And this is sort of like a summary from Twitter uh, that, I, that I took. So for example, uh, transparent review is now uh, the default, um, you know, Authors can share everything from the from the peer review, really making this more more open, um, protecting people who need protection, uh, all sorts of other things. Uh, but the most important thing is this one: we evaluate submissions based only on scientific, methodological, and ethical rigor. Uh, we don't put a premium on novelty. So some of the students also yesterday in the other session, one of the students said, "I don't I don't know if my research is." is novel enough. I don't know if I'm creative enough. I don't know if, if what the, the idea that I have for my thesis, is it good enough or not? And my message is, you know, novelty is so subjective. We don't know. When you ask 50 different people over one question, do you think that this is novel? 
people will come up with different things. So novelty should not be a criteria. Uh, science should be objective. The way that we assess things objectively is just like you did in your RR assessment. So you look at scientific, methodological, and ethical rigor. Uh, not so much about how much of a contribution this is, because you never know. Many of the Nobel Prize uh, winners always complained that when they submitted their own work to journals, the top journals, the top journals rejected them because they had a, you know, a certain thing in mind that they wanted people to submit. Finally, they submitted this to like a third tier journal, and this is what won them the, the Nobel Prize. So you never know what's, what's novel, what's not novel, who is going to find value in your work. It's more important that you really evaluate, you know, construct validity, internal validity, external validity, statistical validity, make everything open. And, and I'm glad to see uh, this journal make, making the shift. Uh, I'll, I'll let you hear this from uh, Samin. Uh, she, she does a good job of explaining these things on her own. Second, the peer review process at Calabra focuses on rigor. We're not going to make decisions based on how novel your paper is, how exciting the results are, or how much we think your paper will boost our impact factor. We do have high standards, but they're all about scientific rigor. Specifically, we focus on the methodological rigor and the match between the evidence and the claims made. We also ask reviewers to provide ratings of construct validity, statistical validity, internal validity, and external validity, along with their comments. We hope this will make the peer review process more predictable for authors. Our subjective judgments of what we find interesting won't factor into our decisions. This will also help level the playing field for all manuscripts, regardless of how popular the topic you study is or what population you're studying. We won't tell you that your work belongs in a more specialized journal or that your sample of non-Americans is too niche for our journal. If it's high quality, transparent research in the domain of psychology, we think it belongs at Calabra. Yes, very well done. So you're, you're welcome to listen to uh, all, all the all the things that she says about the journal. But I really like the second point that she said about rigor. And I know for a fact that sometimes uh, we in Hong Kong have some problems uh, submitting and then people saying, but you've studied this in Hong Kong. How is this relevant? My question is, you studied this in the US. How is that relevant? It's, like, it's not about where you do your research or what the population is. It's about how well you did this and whether you know, your conclusions are aligned with your with your data. So Samin is, is definitely an advocate of, of that. So uh, consider Collabra Meta Psychology for these things. Now, if you're, th you're thinking, what what's the what's like a good example in our field? So when I came to HKU and started talking about open science, I was actually really surprised. I did not know. But one of our faculty uh, here in HKU is based in Hong Kong. Um, I don't know what's going on here with the chess thing, but Scott reached out and told me about this amazing journal. It's really revolutionary, based in Hong Kong, in association with some places in, in China, really changing the way that we do research. I think this journal, whenever I look at this journal, I'm like, oh my God, we in psychology are so far behind. We have to learn from Giga Science, Giga, Gigabyte, and all that. Uh, so you can see that he was part of some collaborations. I just took this from his Google Scholar um, about the FAIR guiding principles for scientific data management and stewardship. It's it's some inspiring stuff. I'm just gonna play the video to you just to uh, to understand like how revolutionary this this thing is, and, and all the possibilities of what journals could be. Why is a journal the PDF? How is that even like? Why is that the acceptable form by which we see a, a journal article? So over there, you can include the data, you can diagrams, you can include the 3D printing uh, options, you can include the videos, you can include everything in this very revolutionary platform that they've had. And I'm, I'm very happy to see, you know, people in Hong Kong taking the lead on this. So he's, I think right now, the editor in this journal and doing a lot to promote this sort of thing. So that's terrific stuff. Right, let's see, let's see how they, uh, introduce the, this journal. Working in scientific publishing a number of years, we've been frustrated by the pace of change. 
with that in mind, we decided to launch Gigabyte to try to break down and address some of the remaining challenges, namely accessibility, interactivity and speed. Gigabytes, we can embed video content. Hi, my name is Chris Hansen. GiggityB is a trusted repository that follows the FAIR principles, whereby research data needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. To achieve this, we have a team of experienced bio-curators that get hands-on and do in-depth data reviews of the unit of work or manuscript associated with each dataset. Gigabyte is a new journal designed from the ground up to be an integrated data publishing platform, and GiggityB's experienced bio-curators interact with the authors during the submission process to ensure that all the underlying data is fair. GigaDB can host unlimited data in our petascale servers. Publish with us and make sure your research data is preserved for the long term in our data center. revolutionary stuff I, I i like it very much uh hope to learn some stuff from them and the remarkable thing is that if i remember correctly i think they've already you know people sometimes especially in our university really care about impact impact factors it's like impact factor has to be uh, above a certain number they've done such a good job i think their impact factor also kind of com comes together with the package and they're doing really well in that so if you publish in Gigabyte, I think also HKU is going to be very happy with you. And I, I can see great things for them uh, in the future. So revolutionary for open science can also fit people who are more traditional. Um, so you can combine all sorts of remarkable things in one in one platform. And I'm very glad that Scott is like, uh, he's here, he's nearby. If you ever want to talk about open science, you can uh, either follow him or on Twitter, perhaps go and meet him. And he's here on campus. So some really inspiring stuff. Um, also, I mentioned before the Royal Society of Open Science. So Chris Chambers, who's, who initiated registered reports, um, says that uh, re, you know, re, Royal Society of Open Science will publish any replication of any, of any article published in, in this journal and other journals in psychology. So every time somebody on Twitter says, you know, we got a rejection of our replication and nobody will publish this. Chris Chambers says, yeah, we'll, we'll publish this, send this to us, we'll, we'll take care of this. We feel like we need to be accountable. So if before you said nobody will, we will publish our, our null findings, nobody will publish our, our replications. So uh, Chris Chambers uh, really helped with this Royal Society of Open Science. So that's a new exciting uh, direction that you can you can consider if you're worried about publishing and also, you know, even here in Pack Factor, you know, they, they've caught up with this, it's like 2.5 or something like that. So uh, even HKU is going to be happy with you publishing in, in this. And I see great things ahead for them in the sense that they're really taking responsibility. And I think with accountability, with uh, trustworthiness, people cite more and people uh, pay more attention. I definitely changed my opinion about this, this journal following these, these new practices. So I think that those things really matter. Judgment and decision-making, so that's my field. It's a journal that's been there for quite some time. It started as a one-man operation. John Barron, I don't know if you remember John Barron from uh, Outcome Bias and a few other biases that we 
that we discussed, uh, he has decided that he's tired of all the other uh, journals and he has made this a no fee uh, self-publishing uh, platform. He handles or used to handle everything on his own. And uh, the remarkable thing is that in 2011, he decided he was the first one who decided that he um, forces all the authors to share all their data. Uh, so you can't hide anymore. You really need to, when you submit to say um, you know, what your data is, how to analyze this, all the stimulus, all the materials upon initial submission. So uh, amazing, he was one of the first to kind of endorse replications and register reports. Um, so uh, interesting stuff. I just want to show you this graph about you know, what happened when he decided to do this change. So you now a lot of the journals are struggling to get their authors to uh, shift to open science, to get them to share their data and their code. Uh, so you can see even PLOS, which is considered to be a leader, is, you know, 2015 got to over 50%. Uh, when John decided to implement this sort of thing, just look what happened. He implemented this in 2011. By 2012, he got close to 100. He says, nobody is going to publish if they don't have open data. And remarkable, since then, 100% data sharing in, in JDM, which is just outstanding. And in the last three years, there was a mass replication effort of the JDM findings by who is now uh, one of the uh, co-chief editors, uh, Andreas. So um, seems like they have a very uh, similar replication rate to what we have here at HKU, uh, about 70% which is definitely uh, much higher. And even with the ones that, that are not, they were able to like identify just looking at the data. First of all, everything is reproducible because you can go back and look at what others have, have done. You don't have to guess you know, what the stimulus, what the materials are. Some of you, I think, had to struggle with doing replications and extensions of stuff that was published long time ago and we don't have access to. Why would we need to contact the, the authors to beg them to share their materials with us in JDM, everything is open in advance. So well done JDM, really changing the field. Well done John Barron uh, on pushing this forward. Hopefully all of them will make it not only the default, but make it absolutely necessary. This is the essence of science. How can it be that you don't have access to, you know, the stuff that you've published with? If you have some concerns about you know, identifiability, uh, anonymity, and so forth. There, there are ways for you to share a data set with protecting your participants by doing sy synthetic uh, data sets and, and other measures, but there's no excuse to not sharing anything uh, at all. Uh, by now we have all the means to make everything share and, and shared and accessible to, to everybody. One of the journals that we uh, tried to publish it, I tried it for the first time with Chinyu, uh, comprehensive results in social psychology. I got to know this from Kai Jonas, who was faculty member who moved to Maastricht University when I was a postdoc over there. So I know Kai very well, and I know his passion about open science. Uh, it, it's terrific. I met, uh, you know, Joe when he was here, giving a talk at HKU last year in the uh, conference uh, that we had over here about research in integrity. So these two together decided to do this journal. What is this journal about? Only register reports. No traditional, you know, send us everything completed. Uh, everything is register reports, only register report. And honestly, that's the way that science should be. Uh, I, really, I really believe in register reports is taking away uh, most, if not all of the biases. So I'll let, I'll let Kai uh, explain this to you. Comprehensive Results in Social Psychology, the first pre-registration journal in social psychology, offers you a unique research experience and publication outlet. We want to better acquaint you with the fundamentals of the submission process. This will allow you to work fluently within the pre-registration approach. 
Let's have a brief overview of the submission process. How do submissions to CRSP look like? The authors will be basically familiar with the process. You submit a manuscript as you normally would. The key difference is that you're only submitting your introduction, your proposed methodology and your proposed analysis. This is the pre-registration part. You're indicating prior to the submission of the final manuscript what you're intending to do with the data and the results. This manuscript will either be desk rejected or sent out for review. After the reviews are in, the action editor handling your manuscript will either issue a revise and resubmit decision or an in-principle acceptance. We call it IPA. In case of a revise and resubmit, you should consider and incorporate the feedback as you would with any manuscript. But in this case, you actually have the chance to let the feedback help you improve the empirical cycle of your research. So far, our authors really benefited from the discussions and feedback prior to running their studies. If an IPA is given, your manuscript will be published regardless of the outcome of the data analysis as long as you follow your proposed data collection and analysis. In other words, an IPA is not unlike an impressed status with the contingency that you do what you said you would do in the pre-registration proposal. Now let's cover some frequently asked questions that have come up since we have launched CRSP. We hope that the submission process has become clear from the above. The first main difference is that you're submitting proposed methods and analysis prior to any data collection. The second main difference is that you get the in-principle acceptance, which guarantees you publication of your manuscript and work if you fully adhere to the pre-registration protocol that you have registered. What does not work is registering your analysis after you have gathered your data. In fact, you can do this, but then it would be a pilot study or it would be clearly marked as exploratory, but not part of the pre-registration process. We have received questions like, does the pre-registration part actually remove the element of exploration and discovery from the scientific process? Or we have received the question, how can my research progress if I'm actually prevented from exploring it or following up unexpected and interesting findings? How could I be expected to anticipate all the studies that I want to run based on the unexpected findings that I discover along the way? Isn't discovery crucial to science? We wholeheartedly agree that discovery is one of the cornerstones of science. And we aren't psychics and we cannot always forecast what our data will tell us. But luckily, CRSP provides exactly for this. There are three different ways in which discovery and exploration still play a role. First, you may submit any exploratory results as pilot data with your initial submission of your manuscript. These may be published with the final manuscript, but will be clearly marked as pilot exploratory data. Second, exploratory results and exploratory studies can be added in after your APA. When you resubmit your IPA manuscript after you have collected and analyzed data, you may include any exploratory analysis in the manuscript, reported after the analysis you pre-registered. At publication, these will be clearly marked as exploratory and separate from the pre-registered aspects. Third, if you have additional studies to include but were not pre-registered, you may include them in the revised manuscript. Again, these will be clearly marked as exploratory, the only caveat is that you cannot have more exploratory studies added into a manuscript than pre-registered ones, roughly speaking. So I think he now helped explain a lot of things that perhaps you had some questions about in terms of why are we doing this register report? So what's the whole idea? So by the end, when you submit your final register report stage one, we will take what it is that you did, maybe make some modifications on that and we'll submit this to a journal. This will go uh, through peer review, we'll get some feedback, hopefully we'll you know, get the, the in-principle acceptance. And only then I will go and get some funding and then run the data, the data collection. So that's a very, very different process than the, the traditional. So definitely some of your projects will submit to Kai over here and this uh, wonderful comprehensive results in social psychology. Uh, I, I think it's revolutionary. I hope to see more, more journals going in this direction. And all the concerns that people typically have about what does it mean that I can't explore. So just like you saw in your templates, definitely can explore, but it needs to be marked as exploratory. So register reports try to kind of take away all the bias. Um, results don't matter. You know, if it's a failed application or successful application, it doesn't matter. You get the in-principle acceptance, then 
you collect your data, and then regardless of what the outcomes is, are, you're going to um, uh, you know, ha have your manuscript uh, published. So that's, that's closer to what I think uh, science uh, should be. There's all sorts of other initiatives about you know, peer review. So we've seen some amazing projects. Uh, we've looked at some of the changes in the publication system in journals that are really uh, trying to adjust to the credibility revolution to do things more openly, more transparently, and taking new initiatives. Uh, embedding new content and uh, doing the process very differently from the traditional journals. I really hope that registered reports is something that's going to pick up. There's already over 200 uh, journals that are doing this, uh, a lot to do with the Center of Open Science, with Chris Chambers and, and um, you know, the team that's working on helping journals adopt this. Podcasts, I follow a few. Uh, you don't have to if you don't want to, but I find those uh, very interesting because it allows you to keep up to date about things that are happening in open science. Uh, James is an interesting uh, figure. Uh, he has recently left academia after being a postdoc, uh, but he still does open science related stuff, uh, works in industry, helping uh, science from, I guess, uh, outside of academia. Just goes to show you don't have to be an academic in order to do open science, have an opinion, contribute to the to uh, you know the, the community. Uh, you can see that his contributions have to do with uh, he was called a data thug, so he really investigates how to uh, detect fraud or detect uh, unlikely statistics. So he came up with a uh, Grim and and other tools to help see if the stats are too good to be true, and he exposed some of uh, problematic uh, figures, problematic articles, again and again, uh, Brian Wanzink uh, is, is one of them. Uh, the other figure in this uh, very entertaining podcast, Everything Hurts, is Dan Quintana. Uh, I think this guy is, is remarkable, really, my, my hat off to him. Everything that he does is inspiring to me. Uh, I don't know how he does everything that he does, like where does he find the time for all of that? But very clear, very eloquent, uh, seems like a real gentleman in the way that he is uh, open to talking to everybody, shares everything that he does, really tries to promote uh, openness, transparency, uh, deal with uh, difficult issues head on. He has his own research, uh, oxytocin, heart rate, uh, so he does some other podcasts as well on physiology, uh, but in this podcast, you really get to see the the, the scale of, of both of them, you know, the knowledge. He's kind of sort of like the, the nice guy. James is more like the, the bad boy. And they complement each other well. Uh, it's kind of, it works in, 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 a, in a funny way. Sometimes they have some guests. I think we'll, we'll uh, meet one of them soon and you get to, to see them. I, I strongly encourage them uh, as, as something that you can listen to. Occasionally they do some stuff I would rather they won't, uh, but uh, I, I, in general, I, I really think that uh, they're terrific and, and worth following. A bit more in the psychology uh, direction, I think you've met Simin Vazir, so she was the editor of uh, SPPS, which is what is in the bio over here, now she is the editor of Collabra. She does a lot of stuff, uh, videos, talks about open science all the time. She recently moved from UC Davis to I think uh, Melbourne in, in Australia. She writes this blog, Sometimes I'm Wrong. Sanjay over here, also an inspiration, talks about all sorts of things. He has this blog um, and, and talks about open science. He was the president of the Society of Improvement of Psychological Science. I think Alexa is now, uh, she hosted the last, uh, the last uh, session for, for the conference that we had. So I think she, she took over. But it's very, very interesting hearing, you know, listening to these three talk about issues of open science. They start with some, you know, babble about their lives, which is sometimes also interesting. Then they take questions. So, for example, if you're an undergraduate, early career, and you have questions for them, they take, they take questions and they will try best they can to answer this. If you're running into some difficulties, if you have a dilemma, they will try to, to address this. And then finally, for about 20 minutes, I guess they they talk about some uh, contemporary issues in, in open science. 
uh, I find myself often disagreeing with some of the of the views, although they sometimes disagree with one another. But I think what's important for students to get from this is that you have a diversity of opinions. And sometimes you learn that even very senior uh, professors don't always have good answers, uh, don't always know how to solve everything in open science, how to deal with a situation. I think to me, it was a humbling experience. It's, it's not just me that I have doubts, you know, as an early career, uh, perhaps you as, a, as an undergraduate, you feel like sometimes you don't know what's going on and you don't have control. Sometimes even very experienced senior scholars um, trying to, to make sense of this. And I think it's really important for us to listen to these discussions to understand how complex science can get. Very similar things I feel about these two psychologists for beers. So I played to you in the first session about these two. So Yoel Inbar um, was uh, you know, partially responsible, part of a few people that exposed Diedrich Stapel in Tilburg University. Uh, Michael Instead has um, you know, his contribution. Um, he was famous for ego depletion. Now he's a proponent of, of open science. Also with them, I often find myself not agreeing to everything, but always learning from both of them. And I like how open they are about their opinions, about their doubts, about their process, um, and really inspiring in their ability to learn, grow, even as senior researchers, not rejecting open science, but really uh, opening up about everything that they've done and wanting to learn and improve uh, even further. Uh, recently, I think in one of the last two episodes, Michael was saying that one of the things that he feels a little bit bad about, like he feels like he's left behind and his students have, have far exceeded his own abilities. It's something that I, I feel on a, an ongoing basis. You know, I, you try to keep tra track of things. Uh, you try to keep uh, up to date with everything that's going on in terms of the open science, the code, the methods and all this. But I already know that the students that are working with me, sometimes even with you, uh, you're able to do remarkable things that I have no time to catch up on. Even if I would put you know, some effort, uh, it will take me uh, forever to, to catch up. So part of the process, just like Michael was saying, is to, to know how to, to work with you, to work with students, to work with collaborators and to learn. You know, everybody brings their own, their own thing. In a collaboration, um, you, you can't know everything. There's, there's very little control. You have to just have a measure of trust. So a lot of things in this course require that you work with one another, that you establish uh, trust. Uh, sometimes when you have you know, differences of opinion that you're able to overcome these differences, find some kind of um, you know, a, a midway for you uh, to, to work together, even if you have different directions going in different uh, you know, opposite uh, paths, uh, then to come and, and present this together. You know, come come to work. So first in your groups, then in your teams, then with the classmates, then with us, the tutors and the instructor. Um, it's it's an inspiring journey. So the whole thing about how to do collaborations, how to work with students, how to work with others, uh, a lot of stuff that I've learned from listening to to these two talk. So uh, that's kind of like the beginning of the people who inspired me. Now I want to look into uh, more in depth about specific uh, figures. Uh, so um, Amy, uh, I like what I like about her, why I wanted to start with her is because she really did some remarkable things together with uh, others, Sophia and Sam, about establishing a world network. A world network is just like today I was just looking at how many labs, how many people in how many places in the world have joined them. So they've established a journal club where they just discuss open science, they discuss journals. And I was just looking today, it's like, how many in Europe? 76 journal clubs, even in Asia, you know, there's, there's a, in Taiwan, in Japan. I really hope that you will help build the one in Hong Kong, uh, India, North America, Brazil, Australia. It, it's quite remarkable. I'll let Amy uh, talk about this. She talks here. Um, so I was talking about everything hurts. So I think they're, you know, they, they far exceeded 100 episodes. So their discussion with Amy is their congratulations for the 100 episode of their podcast, where they ask Amy, Amy, explain to us how, how did this happen? How did you 
come to do a journal club that now has so many uh, people around the world. So here's a little bit from Amy. And I just want to say, you have to keep in mind, a student, PhD student, I think only recently she got like a position, she moved somewhere else, but everybody, you know, Amy, Sam, Sophia, Jade, uh, we, we're working a little bit with Jade or Nero, uh, oh, Katie, like all, all of these are early career researchers. No, nobody told them to do this. Nobody supported them. They did this on their own. And now it's, it's a movement. It's uh, unbelievable. So here's, here's Amy. What's the latest there? It's a movement. Yeah, it's, well, I think it's a community, you know, and you've been talking about community on the podcast and giving back to community, um, creating community. And I think that's where everything hurts also fits in, you know, as early career researchers trying to navigate new ideas, maybe in environments that are slightly hostile. Um, the open science community can't really, the importance can't be overstated. And Reproducibility has been really growing. Um, yeah, we're now at over 60 journal clubs, um, I think in 18 different countries, if I know my stats. Um, but, you know, I think what's most special about it is the community. It's people who are building our website, who are organizing um, replicats initiatives with reproducibility, mm. who are creating boards and libraries to display things about open science or creating a group um you know and this is undergrads up to postgrad up to lecturers so um and every reproducibility is different so i can't speak for anyone but uh everyone together is really great shout out to singapore reproducibility big fan of singapore yeah. club they, they... Well, if, you're, if you're gonna list everyone down this there's, there's so many yeah. now um, <laughs> how did how did that happen how did you go from sort of like um, you, you you know, we're a gang of ne'er do wells with a teapot to to being in so many damn places. I mean, you've obviously touched some kind of nerve. Are people organizing this themselves? Yeah, so people are getting in touch and organizing it on the ground themselves, and I think that's why you know all the credit goes out to them because actually, you know, organizing a journal club is a lot of work, um, scheduling and choosing the papers and just the anxiety of who's going to turn up, you know, <laughs> will I get more than just me and my, my partner. And so, so they are organizing on the ground and people do different things. Um, but I think the success of it, I think maybe it hit a nerve at the right time. Um, we had, we still have funding from UKRN. So the UK reproducibility network, um, to create, teapots for, for UK-based journal clubs or stickers um, for international journal clubs. I saw you, you know, posting them on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, it takes a long time, you know, like I've been writing these envelopes um, and yeah, so that definitely takes the most of most my time. At the English second. thing in the world, you've organized a local network and you've got funding for teapots. <laughs> well, I think, so I think you can get a sense of the interaction. So like uh, James over here is kind of like, <laughs> he's a funny guy. Um, and Dan was trying to kind of like uh, be the responsible asking, that is asking questions. And then Amy was very charming and, um, you know, talks about, about the process. And really um, this is as a grassroots movement by students um, really taking the initiative from nothing, you know? So just seeing them mobilize on Twitter following everything that Amy and the team are, are doing, uh, each in his own, her, his way is, uh, is inspiring. And this is obviously not the, the only thing that she and uh, these people are, are famous uh, for. Sam does a lot of other stuff. Sophia as well. Amy is also, you know, the multiverse analysis and, and stuff like that. So just Following, following these early career researchers is uh, like, I really wish when I was in my PhD that I was I ha have the courage and the initiative to do, to do stuff like that. Uh, this is still ahead for you. So regardless of what it is that you decide to do, you can follow in Amy's uh, footsteps and uh, decide either to form a journal club or do other things. So inspiring words from, from Amy. 
We met Michelle already. I told you uh, that she's responsible for uh, StatCheck. I'll just let her introduce a bit about StatCheck very, very briefly. She did this in, uh, I think, a minute or two uh, to tell. And this, and this is her PhD project. Uh, now she's an assistant professor, but she has changed a lot of things in our field. If you want to check your manuscripts, uh, your submissions to see if there's some stats errors, you can and go and upload your manuscript over here and it will tell you if your uh, stats are, are solid or not. Here's how. Uh, yeah, hi everybody. My name is Michelle and I would like to present StatCheck, which is basically a spell checker for statistics. Um, let me first introduce what the problem is. This is a, a paragraph that I copied from a published psychology paper. And in psychology, we're used to backing up our conclusions with statistics, um, like this one, for instance. And the nice thing about statistics like this is that it consists of three parts that should be internally consistent. Now, if I take these reported degrees of freedom and this reported test statistic, then the p-value that I get is actually 0.86, which is not at all the 0.01 that they report here. Um, what we find is that in psychology, roughly half of the papers contain at least one error like this, and in one in eight, it actually could maybe have changed the statistical conclusion. So the conclusion changes from non-significant to significant, or the other way around. Um, given that it, this it happens in so many papers, I think this is worth looking into and trying to detect and prevent these kind of errors. And to that end, um, I built a package, the R package stat check together with my co-author Sasha Epscomp. And thanks to Sean Reif, who's also here in the room somewhere, there he is. Um, we also now have a web app where you can simply upload a paper, stat check will screen the text, extract the statistics, and checks whether these statistics are internally consistent or not. Um, so effectively, what it is, uh, it's a spell checker for statistics. I think it's very useful to use in self-checks before you submit a report to a journal, um, in peer review when you're screening other people's work, and in meta research if you want to screen large sets of statistics and say something about the consistency rates. So thank you very much. That's terrific stuff. And it's amazing that we haven't thought of, of doing this before. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Michelle, for that. And because of that, now we have P-Checker that checks a bunch of other things. So we have uh, more elaborate tools, but she kind of set the foundations and, you know, out of nowhere, uh, she did this for her PhD. So that's inspiring. Uh, that's terrific. Chris Chambers, we talked a lot about. Um, so you can see that, you know, I took this from his Google Scholar, a lot of things about uh, reproducible science register reports, promoting registrar reports, really building you know, the, the infrastructure. I'm just gonna show you, I'll start from the second one about early career researchers. So you're thinking, you know, as a student, what does this registrar report, how is this valuable for me? What can I learn from this? Uh, Chris is really inspiring, not only in pushing registrar reports, but really helping people understand that actually it's valuable for them. It's valuable for you in your career, whatever stage you are, uh, you are in. And this is why in this course, we're doing everything as register reports. Here's from Chris Chambers. A registered report suitable for me as an early career researcher? Um, yes, in, in, my, in my opinion they are, and the evidence from the submissions we're getting suggests that this is indeed the case. They send a signal that you're a scientist that cares about transparency and reproducibility, not just playing the game, as we say, but seeking to make real discoveries. And there's no reason for this quest for understanding nature and truth to trade off against the incentive structure in science. By pursuing this route, you can still publish in prestigious journals offered by Royal Society, APA, the Nature Group, etc. Um, but you can do so in a way that um, sends a signal that you care about discovering something true rather than manufacturing stories that will um, um, uh, that reviewers and editors will find attractive and interesting. And also there's perhaps a more pragmatic benefit, which is when you're going for postdoctoral positions, it's, it's worthwhile um, thinking about how your CV will look if you're coming to the end of a PhD. Um, it's very common um, for finishing graduate students to list their, their CVs with lots of in preparation or submitted papers. Um, but in fact, um, if you pursue 
some, at least some registered reports, then your CV at that endpoint, even if you haven't completely finished writing up the final end stage of the registered report, you will still have um, more to say about the work that is in progress. So for example, a paper might say provisionally accepted at journal um, rather than in preparation or submitted. So personally speaking, as PI myself, if I see a, a CV with a provisionally accepted registered report, I know that that's a paper that actually exists and has gone through peer review, whereas when I see in preparation or submitted, there's always this question in my mind as to how far that work has really progressed and, if, in fact, if that work exists at all. What is well, that captions uh, wasn't very good. I think the sound quality was, was not high, but I think it's really important that once you submit this, uh, um, you know, the, your reports, and once we submit this to the, to the journals, you can already add this to your CV. So a lot of our students who completed uh, replications and extensions in this course already have publications and now they're able to put this on their CV and it helped them both when they apply to uh, industry or especially if they would decided to go to, to grad school. So there is value of doing scientific uh, projects, especially in the form of register reports uh, within a course like, uh, like ours. So that was a little bit, um, let me see how much time we have. Okay. Maybe one more. Now that's all well and good in theory. So how can we make this happen in, in practice? And this is where registered reports comes in. So we set up registered reports three years ago in the general cortex. And the idea was to try and incentivize a different, a more radical, different way of thinking about publishing. There are four key features. The first is that Researchers decide their hypotheses, their procedures, their main analyses before they embark on data collection. Part of the peer review process takes place before the experiments are conducted, so that protocol is peer reviewed. Passing that stage of peer review virtually guarantees publication if you follow through with your protocol. And original studies and high value replications are welcomed as part of the so I think you've heard this already from Kai. We talked about this many times, but I wanted you to see this because uh, Chris was the first one who in 2013 in Cortex, uh, um, you know, initiated this, this sort of thing. Back then, everybody thought that this is a crazy idea, but thanks to Chris Chambers, it became a reality. Now we take it for granted, but I have to tell you, you know, I was doing my PhD in 2013. If you told me that register reports are possible, I would, I would just be, you know, blown away. It's just like it was unheard of. Nothing like this ever happened in science. So we owe a lot of, of things, uh, gratitude to Chris Chambers for the work that he has done. Uh, Daniel Atkins, I owe Daniel Atkins my commitment to uh, open science. So when I was in Maastricht, he is still in Eindhoven. That's an hour away from Maastricht. So I would come up and, and hear him talk about uh, these sort of things. Uh, he's an interesting he's an interesting guy he does so many uh, different things um i think he learned from very, you know during his phd that there's an issue and he was devoted to uh, making a real change uh, many of the tools the things that we do like equivalence testing sometimes uh, things that have to do with the effect size calculation can you imagine like he published this in 2013 this guide he wrote a guide a guide of how to calculate effect sizes look at how many citations this is a 300 500 3500 citations for a guide so uh we'll we'll also try to um you know pub publish the guides because you can see the the hunger there is for other people to understand simple things like how do you calculate an effect size for a t-test? Can you imagine that in 2013, we didn't have a clear guide? So Daniel came in, explained this very, very clearly, and now we all know how to do this. So even things like guides, how to do equivalence tests, you know, how to, how to justify your p-value uh, can, can have a lot of, of value, inspiring stuff. I'll just show you uh, what he writes, uh, what he says about power analysis, about uh, two minutes, uh, just so you can get a sense of, of the personality. Uh, and I really recommend uh, that you follow his two courses. Um, terrific stuff. Like if you're going to grad school, don't miss this. Do these two courses. It will change the way that you understand science. Here's from Daniel.
So in recent years, I think as a field, we've, di we've discovered that our sample sizes are very often not based on anything. We set out to develop a study and then we decide upon a number of participants that we want to collect, very often based on some heuristics, like 20 participants in each condition is enough. So the concept of statistical power is actually a way to quantify the probability that you'll find a statistically significant effect if there really is a true effect to be found. And it's based on the effect size and the sample size and the alpha level that you decide upon when you design a study. And this is actually a very important part of designing a study, figuring this out, your sample size, justifying your sample size. And statistical power is one good way to do this if you want to find a statistically significant significant result in your study. If you design a study, you want to have an informative result. So you want to make sure that the data you collect will tell you something about what's likely to be true about the world. And that's the moment that you can think about these issues before you collect the data. That's the moment where you can think, okay, how can I design an informative study? And power analysis, while you are designing a study, make sure that your data collection will be as informative as possible given the resources that you have. So if you don't think about the sample size before you design your study, the problem is that your sample size might not be good enough to draw informative conclusions. This is especially problematic if you do not find a significant effect when you analyze the data, because in this case, you're not really sure if there's really no effect or if you just didn't observe a significant effect because the sample size was too small to have a sensitive study. Now it's a very so part of what I really like about Daniel is his clarity. He has this ability to really simplify things and allow people to understand uh, very complex notions uh, very easily. And he has really contributed a lot in promoting open science in changing the way that we do that we do things uh, in all sorts of different it's just the diversity of the stuff that he is involved in is uh, is really is really inspiring and uh, many times i cite his work i use the tools that he has built it's uh, it's, uh, it's terrific stuff uh, dorothy bishop i think i mentioned her a few times about uh, you know the cognitive biases in the way that we do uh, science so how scientists can stop fooling themselves over statistics fixing the replication crisis. Uh, she does, uh, you know, amazing uh, methods workshops. I think some of the students that we saw before uh, are come, come from her lab, work with her, uh, at least somehow associated with some of the work that she does. Um, so I really, I really like uh, listening to her uh, talk. I learn a lot of things uh, from her and part of the research that I do about cognitive biases in scientific work is built is inspired by her uh, directions and built on her her work so here's a little bit from her talking about early career uh, researchers and the power of social media but the change i think also the very interesting change has been social media because social media has given a voice to people that previously didn't have one, which is mainly junior early career scientists who may have been encouraged to do this or sort of really suffered as a result of finding they can't replicate something that was uh, published and looked as if it was solid. And they're actually, you know, actually getting quite militant about making science better. And in the past, the only way if you found something in a journal that you didn't think was well done or didn't agree with, we did a letter to the editor who may decide to publish it several months later. Um, whereas now people can zip up on Twitter and say, hmm. So what do, you, what do you mean with they're getting militant about it? They uh, aggressively yeah, they, they, draw attention to it? Yeah, and, uh, and they're concerned to try and bring about all sorts of changes. Um, so we've, with a couple of colleagues, I've been running a course on advanced reproducible methods um, for three years now, uh, four years, I think this was the fourth we've just done, uh, with early career. Uh, researchers and they go off you know really fired up and in Oxford we start we had a very good group of early career researchers who started various initiatives so they started having a journal club called reproducibility with TEA at the end where we drink tea and talk about <laughs> yes yeah, so her workshop uh, reproducibility uh, started uh, I think with some of the people who attended this uh, workshop where uh, there's a, a, a nice of her and Amy uh, together so they know each other well 
and this power of social media. So now if you want to contribute, you can get fired up as well and, and find your way of contributing to the open, open science uh, movement and uh, work with people like Dorothy who are very passionate about this sort of thing. Stuart, I, I mentioned him because up till this year, we did not have a good uh, book about the open science uh, movement and the science crisis and all this, but this book really captures uh, things very well. I think Chinio recently uh, kind of read this book and was uh, was very glad with, with the content and the way that things are, are framed. Um, there's like five minutes about his uh, BEM replication. So he's one of the, uh, the people who decided to replicate failing, failing the future uh, and having three unsuccessful attempts to replicate, uh, you know, people are able to feel the future. So he has been involved in this uh, open science movement when I think it started in 2011, 2012. He was one of the first ones. And since then, he's been an advocate of open science, trying to get people to change the way that they think, uh, they think about, about science. Uh, if you want to hear more from him, uh, inspiring stuff, also very clear, very eloquent, um, terrific. Hopefully one day I'll have the ability to communicate uh, that, that nicely. So uh, afterwards you can go and check out the links. Uh, same with Brian Osek. So he's the founder of the Center of Open Science. Perhaps you are familiar with him for the, his work on IAT. So implicit association test, uh, Howard, uh, Harvard implicit and other work, but he has realized that a lot of things in his work, he's one of the senior ones who decides to, to change his ways. He formed the nonprofit of the Center of Open Science. He, it's now, it's like a monster. There's so many people involved. Uh, it's really making a change in our field. Uh, every time I uh, want to uh, explain something, I find that he has already done a really good video on this. So when I try to show my, um, you know, students, people coming to me and say, can you explain to us why, why should we do our replication? So Brian Osek uh, recently had a really good talk about how exciting doing a replication uh, could be. And I completely agree with that. There's so many things in a replication that can, can help uh, uh, science and can feel very rewarding in terms of scientific work. So uh, you're also welcome to, to listen to his talk over here. There's also uh, more posted on, on my website. Uh, something brief about uh, Nick. Um, Nick is a PhD student um, and he's over, over 50. So it just goes to show that uh, PhD students come in, in, all, in all ages uh, and he's not afraid of things. So he goes head to head together with James Heathers. If you remember uh, sort of like the bad boy from Everything Hurts. So both of them together have exposed a lot of fraud, a lot of problems in, in science uh, that have led to, uh, you know, for example, uh, duplicate um, publications, uh, you know, people self, self uh, reusing their own materials again and again many times or citing only themselves. So uh, leading to all sorts of people being investigated or, or uh, quitting uh, prestigious jobs like being an editor of one of our best journals. So Nick has really helped um, change the field. Uh, a PhD student, uh, un unbelievable. It's uh, the stuff that he has done is, is terrific. It takes a lot of courage. So of, all sorts of other people, I borrow a lot from Felix. I use some of his tools. I explain stuff to you uh, from, from his website. I use his presentations a lot, follow him, some really inspirational stuff. Uh, the Jamovi developers, you already know, the Jasper uh, uh, promoting the Bayesian analysis over here with EJ. EJ does a lot of inspirational stuff uh, beyond that. And the main point is that there are many, 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 many more. Actually, there's lots of hidden slides. I'll, I'll upload this later to the OSF so you can check out some of the slides yourself, follow the links and find your own inspiration. Perhaps you'll find other people. Uh, my, my list is very, very, very long. I really had to kind of think uh, what to put over here. Perhaps in, in other presentation, I put other people. But I hopefully this got you, gave you sort of like a taste of, of the things that are going on right now in science, the things that are going on right now in the open science movement, the opportunity that you have as undergraduates, as early career researchers to really make a difference no longer do you have to follow in our footsteps and you know 
just go through the hierarchies like professor is God and we are you know unworthy uh, students are the one leading this revolution and you can be a part of this if you choose to be regardless of whether you are in the industry or in uh, academia uh, you can make a difference and there are ways for you to do this also here if you decide that you're staying in, in Hong Kong finally I just want to like the last slide is just to show you uh, our team so the team that has been doing replications and extensions for uh, three years now. So just look at all the people who have joined us from all around the world. You know, we've got Canada and, and the US and um, uh, France, Netherlands. It's like we've got uh, from all over the world, people have joined to take your replication and extensions, our students. And how many students did we have? I just didn't have enough place to like put all of them. Just like look at the numbers of all the people who have been involved uh so far um you know some of the the teaching assistants from previous semester you know the teaching assistants we have now so six of them overall uh just look at you know the guided thesis the students that have worked with me to do replication and extensions the people who are helping you do peer review on your on your google docs hopefully you, you got to see some of them commenting perhaps they'll give you an additional feedback in terms of of documents uh, but really, you know, when I started this little thing, our little many labs for JDM here at HKU, I never thought it would be this, uh, this big, but we're talking you know, hundreds of people uh, by now with a real impact from around the world. So it just goes to show, you know, just like a first year assistant professor at the university, I, I didn't even have an idea of what I was doing, but because I was working with some amazing students, I was working with amazing tutors, uh, working with other early career researchers, all of those are early career, you know, PhD students, postdocs, uh, first year, second year assistant professor join, joining me to do this uh, remarkable project and it's already having a, a big impact and it's just gonna, you know, keep, keep growing. Uh, so if you want to be more involved, even if you, after the semester has ended, if you want to take a, a leading part, if, you know, future semester you want to come in and be a tutor if you want to be a peer reviewer if you want to contribute in some other way that like we'd love to 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 have you to have you join us uh, beyond being a student in a course doing coursework there's so many opportunities so either with our team or any of the other teams and initiatives um, many ways for you to contribute so hopefully this will give you a little bit of an inspiration for things that you can do uh, in the future uh, this kind of sums up uh, my part of the course. Uh, thank you for being with me. Uh, hope that you found this uh, interesting, uh, that you learned something from it. Uh, next week, I'm going to be going over your stuff. So I'm really looking forward uh, Sunday, Monday morning, going over your presentations and then uh, sharing these with you with some commentary uh, next week. Once again, any questions, comments, things that you want to share, uh, you can find me on Slack. I'll see you next week.